Great. Okay. Um, let's go to our regular uh, programming. I want to start with an update for you on Nigeria, where our humanitarian colleagues, um, from our humanitarian colleagues on the situation in Dikwa in Borno State. Uh, humanitarians are concerned about the situation of thousands of internally displaced people and civilians in the area following the recent attacks we briefed you uh, on yesterday. Following intense attack in Marte and surrounding areas since March 14th, excuse me, since February 14th, nearly 3,400 displaced people, including more than 2,000 children, arrived in Dikwa. It's estimated there are more than 76,000 internally displaced people in the in town of Dikwa due to the ongoing conflict since 2009. As of now and following ongoing military operations on the ground, we, along with our partners, are unable to assess further the humanitarian situation. We reiterate our calls on all armed parties to immediately stop the violence and ensure the protection of civilians and civilian infrastructure, humanitarian assets, as well as uh, personnel. Um, back here in the Security Council, David Shearer addressed the Council for the last time as head of the peace peacekeeping mission in South Sudan. He noted the first anniversary of the transitional government, adding that despite some positive steps, progress has been slow. There's been minimal progress on constitution making, transitional justice, and economic reform, he said. Mr. Scheer also pointed out that the unification of forces has yet to happen despite multiple self-imposed government deadlines as a result of thousands of troops festering in cantonment sites without adequate shelter, health care, or food. Ending on a personal note, he told council members that at the end of four years in South Sudan, he looks back with a certain level of comfort on how far the country has come. There is a ceasefire, he said, a peace deal, a transitional government, a presidency, a council of ministers, governors, and local leadership is slowly being installed. However, the reality is that the peace process remains extremely fragile. It is for, these, for those people that we, the international community, must remain united and committed to pushing the peace process forward, he said. His remarks have been shared with you. Um, and the Deputy Secretary General took part uh, yesterday in the first annual meeting of the group of UN entities called the Regional Collaborative Platform. She said that Africa's regional know-how, assets, and policy expertise will, now, will be more systematically channeled to the resident coordinators and UN country team across the continent as they help countries ensure inclusive and sustainable transition out of the COVID-19 crisis. The Regional Collaborative Platform brings together all UN entities working on development for the 2030 Agenda, addressing key challenges that transcend country borders, such as health and environment. It is chaired by Amina Mohammed. Uh, UNICEF, as you may have seen today, released a report showing that schools for more than 168 million children globally have been completely closed for an entire year due to the lockdowns. According to UNICEF, uh, around 214 million children or one in seven have missed more than three quarters of their in-person learning. Um, UNICEF warns that the most vulnerable children and those unable to access remote learning are at an increased risk of never returning to the classrooms and even being forced into child marriage or child labor. The full report is online. Uh, some good news from our UN teams on the African continent who've helped ensure that today's arrival of millions of doses of COVID-19 vaccines through the COVAX facility. The vaccines have now arrived in Angola, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Gambia, Kenya, Rwanda, and Senegal. More than a million doses arrived in Kenya today, transported by UNICEF. The vaccine um, rollout kicks off on Friday. Rwanda received 340,000 doses today, with UN resident coordinator Fode Njai hailing this historic moment as a big boost for hope and recovery. Senegal, 320,000 uh, doses today. Uh, that will help authorities' efforts to vaccinate 20% of the population. Uh, the DRC received more than 1.7 million of vaccines with the UN team's support. And in the Gambia, the first shipment of 36,000 doses of COVAX-backed uh, vaccines arrived last night with the support of the UN team. Uh, government is preparing to kickstart the vaccination with healthcare workers and those underlying conditions in age 65 and above. Also yesterday, 620,000 doses arrived in Angola with the UN support. We will help 
cover an initial 10% of the country's first phase of vaccine needs. The vaccination efforts began yesterday with a 71-year-old lady receiving the first shot. Today is, oh, sorry, Monday is International Women's Day. The theme this year is Women in Leadership, Achieving an Equal Future in a COVID-19 World on the Way to the Generation Equality Forum. In his message for the day, the Secretary General said the pandemic has erased decades of progress towards gender equality. He stresses that we, as we recover from the pandemic, support and stimulus packages must target women and girls specifically, including through investments in women-owned businesses and care economy. He adds that a pandemic recovery is our chance to leave behind generations of, ex of exclusion and inequalities. UN Women will be hosting a virtual event that day at 10 a.m., and the Secretary General will take part. A lot more information on UN Women's website. Today is uh, World Wildlife Day. This year's theme is Forest and Livelihood, Sustaining People and Planet. The planet's uh, forests are home to some 80% of all terrestrial wild species. Forests help regulate the climate and support of livelihoods of hundreds of millions of people. In his message, the Secretary General said the unsustainable exploitation of forest harms communities and contributes to biodiversity loss and climate disruption. He urges governments, businesses, and people everywhere to scale up efforts to conserve forest and forest species, to support and to listen to the voices of forest communities. In doing so, we will help and contribute to achieving the SDGs for planet and people. Um, today is also a very important day, though it's not an international day. It is James Bayes' birthday, I'm told. Uh, but we're working on a, uh, on a GA resolution at that. Um, uh, I won't say how old you are, James. Um, but I will just say I don't think you qualify for the vaccine in New York yet, though, age-wise, that is. Um, our, our colleagues at the Department of Global Communications are organizing a series of events throughout the month ahead of the International Day of Remembrance of the Victims of Slavery and the Transatlantic Slave Trade. The day will be marked on March 25th. Tomorrow, there'll be an online discussion titled Return to the Root, Exploring Racism Through Dance. The event will, is organized with Lehigh University and will explore the themes of systematic racism, the legacy of slavery throughout the African diaspora populations, and how we can participate in the conversation globally through multiple art forms. More information and links are available at un.org. Tomorrow, our guest will be the Acting Assistant Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Deputy Emergency Relief Coordinator, Ramesh uh, Rajasingham, who will join us to discuss his recent visit to Burkina Faso. Uh, and I have an update on a question you've been asking me quite a bit about, which is uh, Libya. Um, that uh, I can confirm that the UN uh, deployed a small advance team to Libya. The team arrived overnight. The advance team will help advance UN planning in close consultation with the 5 plus 5 Joint Military Commission and provide the foundation for scalable UN support to the Libyan-led and Libyan-owned ceasefire monitoring mechanism. The team will also prepare inputs for the reports that was requested of, of the Secretary General by the Security Council. The advanced team will report its findings to the Special Envoy through the UN's mission coordinator. Meanwhile, over the course of the past few days, Special Envoy for Libya, Jan Kubish, has continued his efforts to mobilize regional and international support to the Libyan-owned, Libyan-led dialogue process. The Special Envoy paid visits to Italy and Turkey and met, among others, with the foreign ministers of those two countries. Um, and uh, we are delighted to report that we are up to 65 member states, fully paid up. Uh, we, our thanks go to Algeria and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. James, it's your birthday. No one will deny you a question today. I don't have to ask about Libya because you just talked about it. Um, so, Myanmar, um, as you'll be aware now, the uh, deputy ambassador mm -hmm. has um, on Facebook posted that he's resigned his post. This is the, um, the deputy PR who uh, was named by the military um, in their communications with the UN as charge. Have you had any communication from either um, the military or from the mission that he is now no longer the charge because he's re 
uh, his, uh, from their view. No, no, exactly. Charged. All all that we've seen is what we've seen on Facebook and report in the media. So we're aware uh, that Yu Tin Maung Nang, uh, the DPR, uh, resigned, but no no official uh, communication. Uh, just the, the process uh, that I alluded to yesterday has moved a little bit. Uh, so following the receipt uh, in the past few days from uh, Kyo Mun Tun, the permanent uh, representative of Myanmar to the UN, and then the other letter I alluded to from the foreign ministry, they have been shared, uh, referred to uh, the chair of the credentials uh, committee, the permanent representative of Tanzania. Um, Upon request of the chair, those communications have now also been circulated to all the members of the Credentials uh, Committee. And one, I know it's my birthday, but I'm still going to complain about something. Um, <laughs> they wouldn't be your birthday if, if you weren't <laughs> complaining about something. Um, sorry, the no, it's very okay. important story yeah. from UNICEF and an important exhibit in the garden. Um, I can't understand why, and the Secretary General even visited, why the press were not invited. I mean, it's not, I mean, I understand yeah. COVID, but it was in the garden. No, I can't I, see why no, we, I, I, if you wanted the power of that, why you would not invite us um, uh, to cover it. I mean, I'm not the only one. I know Toby had a crew wanted yeah. to go and cover it as well. It, 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 barking mad. Uh, well, uh, the bark has been received. Uh, ED, and then we'll. Um, <laughs> another uh, follow-up okay. on um, Myanmar. Can we heard what uh, Special Envoy Shrana Bergener is doing. What has the Secretary General himself been doing on Myanmar? Has he tried to talk to any of the generals? Has he been talking to leaders in the region? Yes, so he, he has been uh, spending, over the last uh, week or so, uh, spending quite a bit of time on the phone uh, speaking to members of focusing uh, on members of ASEAN, uh, including uh, the current presidency of ASEAN, uh, which is uh, Brunei, uh, Brunei. And he has spoken also since the coup uh, to, um, to permanent representatives and, uh, and foreign ministers uh, from member states who've had, uh, who've, who are inter who've shown interest in this and obviously members of the Security Council. So his, his focus has really been on uh, on trying to unite the international community uh, to speak with one voice on this issue and to overturn, obviously, uh, the actions by the military and restore democracy. And um, a follow-up mm -hmm. on the advance team in Libya. Um, are they, do you know if they're planning to travel? Because in the Secretary General's announcement, I believe that he thought that they should be based in CERT. Um, are, they, are, are they planning to travel from Tripoli, and how long are they planning to stay? Uh, for, I mean, for two challenges in terms of the amount of information we, we can share. First and foremost is the security uh, of, of, the, of, this, uh, of this team. Uh, they will go where they need to go. Uh, given the security and COVID uh, constraints. I think right now they're, um, they've just landed. Uh, they will do whatever they need to do to present a, a strong uh, and clear assessment uh, to, uh, the mission, to the mission leadership uh, and then on to the Secretary General. Uh, yes, go ahead and then, Sylvia. Uh, I have two questions on Iraq. The first one, last night, uh, the 10 rockets slammed a, a military base that's housing U.S. forces. Uh, a contractor passed away. Um, any uh, reaction to this attack uh, just uh, less than a week after the U.S. Uh, rocket attacks in Syria? And it comes two days before Pope Francis visited. No, of course. Uh, Obviously, Secretary General is following uh, the developments in Iraq, including the, uh, the rocket attack, very slowly. He remains very concerned about the, the volatile situation in that region. Uh, and I think it's important for all sides to exercise restraint, uh, avoid any escalation, which would undermine the ongoing diplomatic efforts uh, at finding peace and, and lowering the tensions in that region. And we, of course, uh, all very ho much hope for a successful uh, and safe visit 
uh, of the pontiff uh, to Iraq. Uh, and again, on Iraq, you know, about the sides lowering tension, one side is we don't hear the name of is Iran, and uh, today the uh, Kurdistan regional government published confession of people who conducted the attacks two weeks ago on Erbil, and they said, we got the rockets from Iran. And I want to finish my question, and the Iranian militias told us to do this attack. This is the first time, uh, basically, what the, the Iraqi authorities say, concrete evidence comes out that, of Iran's involvement. Why not naming Iran? Look, there, there are a lot of, uh, of parties uh, that need to hear this message of, of de-escalation. Uh, it includes various armed groups uh, operating in Iraq outside of uh, the control of, uh, of the state. And obviously, uh, powers both regionally and internationally all need to work towards the de-escalation. Uh, sorry, Celia and then Toby. Stefan, could we have an update on the stages of the investigation in the Sure. The, uh, the the work the UN's teams the UN's teams work uh, is ongoing. Our colleagues in DSS are doing a, a review of the security, and obviously uh, we are uh, at the disposal and are working closely with both the Congolese and the Italian authorities in their criminal investigations. I will uh, share with you the name uh, the contact for my colleague Greg Barrow at WFP, who is speaking for the UN on the, uh, on the investigation. Uh, Tobias. Thank you. That is my, my full name. Um, my question is, uh, now that there's a UN team on the ground in Libya, is that an indication that f foreign fighters uh, have left um, or are leaving? Is that a, a positive indication of that? And I have a second question on Tigray. No, I, I think there uh, the, let me just say, we were not waiting for all foreign fighters to leave Libya to send the advanced team. So uh, this is uh, the, the arrival of this advanced team overnight is, is, is an operational issue. We're trying to operationalize the request of the, uh, of the Security Council. They will be there to assess uh, the situation and how we can best support uh, what is a Libyan institution, which is the, uh, the ceasefire monitoring uh, commission. Your other question. And uh, just uh, an update on access uh, for humanitarian efforts in Tigray. Nothing major, no positive major developments to report. Uh, Abdel Hamid. <coughs> Abdel Hamid. Thank you, Stefan. Yes, thank you, Stefan. I want to take you back to 2019 when the uh, former Commissioner General of the UNRWA was accused of misbehavior, uh, mismanagement, and nepotism, uh, etc. I mean, there was a report that proved that he was innocent. And uh, I quote uh, Mr. Krahambul, he said in a recent interview, he said, the Secretary General called me in November 2019 to let me know that the charges of corruption, fraud, mismanagement, and of romantic relations with a female member of the staff had all been dropped. So, in this interview, there are two questions, and I want to ask him. I ask these two questions, not on behalf of him, but as, uh, as a journalist. First, will there be an official apology? issued from the UN to Mr. Granbull. Second, why the report has not been published in full. Thank you. Look, uh, I'm looking for my notes uh, on this. What I can first of all tell you is that the, the report by uh, OIOS will be shared uh, 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 the, the report by OIS, which is an internal procedure, uh, has been shared, is being shared at, uh, at the request of, of member states. And that's the usual, uh, the usual procedure. Uh, but I will answer your question in writing a little bit uh, in, in, a, in a moment. Um, uh, Evelyn. Thank you, Steph. Uh, you mentioned earlier that the Secretary General had spoken to ASEAN and other countries on Myanmar. 
Has he also asked India and China to use their influence on that country? He, he has spoken uh, to a number of regional countries uh, and asked them to do uh, whatever, um, uh, whatever they can do uh, to help uh, correct the situation and, and support the Myanmar people's uh, call for a return to democracy. Okay, uh, I will leave it at that uh, and um, leave you in Brendan's good hands.